So our reading uh, today is from Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 27. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am the Lord who heals you. Well, <coughs> Let's pray before we begin. Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. <clears throat> what a place of abundance, Jehovah Jireh, God our provider brings the Israelites to after the bitterness of the desert. And today we're going to focus on another name, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. God heals. It's an essential part of his character and it's, this is obvious to anyone who's read the Bible. There are numerous accounts in both the Old and the New Testaments of blind people receiving sight, barren women giving birth, people with internal bleeding or impaired hearing or epilepsy being healed, people being healed of snake bites and dysentery and dumbness and fevers. Jehovah Rapha, God heals. And in Exodus 15, verse 26, we read, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And that context is important, isn't it? Because, I don't know about you, but it never ceases to amaze me just how quickly the Israelites forgot that God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt and in the most miraculous fashion imaginable plagues and blood on lintels and death of the firstborn son, leading by cloud and fire, the parting of the Red Sea. And yet, it seems, they still doubted. Poor old Moses. He didn't want the job in the first place, and now the people are grumbling because they've gone three days without anything to drink. Well, I probably would have been miserable too if I hadn't had a drink for three days, but this is to miss the point. The people have been provided for in the past. The people have been rescued in the past. Grumbling smacks not only of ingratitude, but also of a lack of trust. And Moses cries out in desperation, and yet again, the Lord God Almighty reveals that he is a God who passionately cares for his people, even though they probably drive him up the wall, what they would if he was human and had emotions like we have. But God loves and passionately cares for these people. And in this incident, God demonstrates that 
He's not only a God who can destroy enemies, fight for his people and save them, but he can also soothe and salve. I love that word salve. We don't really use it anymore, but it's great in relation to God because God is the healer par excellence. And most clearly we see this demonstrated obviously by Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus who is renowned for being a healer in his early ministry and who with the exception of Elisha the prophet surpasses all others by raising the dead. Most famously Jairus's daughter and Lazarus, the friend of Jesus. And we know too that there are others in scripture who heal, those who represent God, such as the prophets, those sent out by God in Christ, the 12 and the 72. And then of course we read of Stephen, Paul and Barnabas, along with others in the Corinthian and Galatian churches. And you know, it's worth pointing out that there is no indication in scripture that this healing, um, this healing ministry was something that would be limited to the early church. Indeed, we're all here, I suggest, because we believe that God heals today. And we shouldn't be surprised when we hear stories of miraculous healings. This is why we pray for people, after all, because we believe in Jehovah Rapha. Healing reveals the caring character of God. It draws people towards God, yes, but importantly, I would suggest more importantly, it's a sign of the kingdom. In Acts chapter 9, when Tabitha was raised from the dead, it became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus gives his disciples power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. And he commanded them to preach as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So signs and wonders are just that, signs that point to the kingdom. And we tend to focus, don't we, on the wonder of it all and we forget to read the signpost, which points to God and to a renewed creation, a new kingdom, where Revelation 21 tells us, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. And the first, the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Now, you may have come across people, I certainly have, uh, who believe and teach that the miracle of healing was limited to the early church and the gift of healing only given to the apostles. And personally, as I said earlier, I, I find no scriptural evidence for this and I find no evidence of it because I'm persuaded by the testimonies of many that miraculous healing still happen today in many parts of the world. Some of you will have heard of Brother Yun, also known as the Heavenly Man, and you perhaps have read his book of the same name. And he had an amazing ministry in China. Many people have been miraculously healed as a result of his ministry, and many others have come to faith in Jesus. And then there are others that I've heard uh, speak, such as Heidi Backer, who heads up Iris Ministries in Mozambique. And she's witnessed not only people being healed, but actually brought back to life. Incredible. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm a bit like Thomas, you know, I think I need to see it with my own eyes, but she has seen it. She has witnessed it. And this is the work of the God who heals. And it's worth reading books by such people to strengthen our own faith, if we're, if we're doubtful. Because these are eyewitnesses, and we rely on eyewitnesses, don't we, with our Gospels. Also, study the evidence of Scripture alongside some theology, which will encourage you, I hope, to expect miraculous healings 
as we anticipate the coming of our Lord Jesus. Here at Crowhurst, over the last almost 100 years, there's been evidence of miraculous healing. And even probably up to this week, although I'm not up to date with testimonies, people regularly leave here after a few days or even just a few hours, feeling restored, refreshed, spiritually and emotionally rejuvenated, sometimes physically healed. There are always questions about why some experience healing and others don't. It's one of those mysteries and questions that we will ask of the Lord in heaven. But it is not to say that God does not care because he doesn't heal today or tomorrow. Healing has several purposes. So as I said, it's a sign it's a sign to authenticate the gospel message and show that the kingdom of God has come in Christ. It also brings great comfort and health to those who are sick, thereby demonstrating God's mercy towards those in distress, possibly strengthening their faith or indeed giving them faith or strengthening the faith of those around them. In the healing of Peter's mother-in-law by Jesus, and we see too, I always find this quite funny, that healing releases and equips people for service. So she gets up and she immediately starts serving everybody. A woman's place is in the home after all. <laughs> I'll sit down and be quiet in a minute. But um, most importantly, perhaps, healing provides the opportunity for God to be glorified as other people see physical evidence of his goodness, love, power, and presence. So encouraging, isn't it, to hear these, these stories and to see people glowing in the love of Christ, in the presence of Christ in their life. Nevertheless, we must acknowledge that many of our friends and family are not healed as we would love. The complete redemption from physical illness will not be ours until Christ returns and we receive our resurrection bodies. So we're still going to get a cold, I'm afraid, and we're still going to catch flu in this flu season and all sorts of other ailments. It's part of the physical condition. Sometimes God will not grant the special faith that James refers to in his letter, that healing will occur. And at times God apparently chooses not to heal because of his own sovereign purposes. It's a mystery which no one can fathom. Nevertheless, I contend, nevertheless, we have faith. And that faith is a powerful witness to those outside the church. I knew a young man at my church in London a few years ago who was under 40 when he contracted cancer and he decided to use the opportunity of this terminal illness to write to all his non-believing friends to tell them why he was not afraid of dying. And he sent them each a book about Jesus. And many of us were praying that Stuart would be healed. But I have to say that, <clears throat> that his way of dying and the glorious funeral service that followed were clearly used by God to tell of God's grace and power and love and peace. You see, Stuart wasn't afraid of dying. He was looking forward to seeing his Lord face to face. And I could tell you a similar story of another young man that I trained with for the ministry. And he was ordained as a deacon, but was already very ill. His one desire was to be priested so that he could administer communion to those who were sick and suffering. And he was able to do that, albeit just for a few precious months. And that was another marvellous, highly emotional funeral service of celebration as all his um, fellow ordinands, all, we were all priested by them, we all gathered at this marvellous 
funeral service. And Jo had planned everything to include humour and faith and love in all that we shared together. Even as we sang, we will meet him in the air with tears rolling down our faces. I'm not aware of one person whose faith was diminished by the untimely death of our brother. Indeed, we were all rejoicing that his suffering was at an end. It's about having that eternal perspective. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This life is not all there is. And I think that that is what hampers our faith and our understanding so often. The Apostle Paul knew something of suffering, didn't he? With his thorn in the flesh, whatever it was. And he believed it was given to him to keep him humble. And we read in 2 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, says God, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient. We do see, all of us see many instances of people not being healed, both by Jesus and by the apostles. And this doesn't seem to have been questioned by them. Indeed, James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. God can use sickness to draw us closer to himself and to increase in us our obedience to his will. So like the psalmist, we might say, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. We all need to take time to reflect on what God our healer is saying to us, whatever our circumstances. I believe that God, uh, I believe that we can say God is our healer with confidence, even in the context of illness. For Christians trust that whenever the situation, that whatever the situation, God can work for the good. But I don't use that phrase lightly and I don't suggest you necessarily say that to somebody who tells you of their diagnosis. Those are hard words to hear. We know with hindsight, I think, God can use these situations for the good, but we don't always see it until after the event. And we might see someone coming to faith while they're ill, broken relationships being reconciled, rifts healed, emotional and spiritual healing or salvation is more important than physical healing because the whole of eternity lies open to us. Paul tells the Philippians to rejoice in all circumstances. Again, really hard words to have said to you. I mean, we, we sometimes bandy these words around, don't we? I mean, they're wonderful words, don't get me wrong. But in all circumstances, the point he's making is that in everything, God receives the glory and our joy and trust in him should increase. By no means am I suggesting that Paul says we say phony prayers of thanksgiving when there's a terrible disaster or when someone close to us receives a bad diagnosis. But it's about where we put our faith, who we put our trust in. Is God good? Do we trust him? Where do we see him at work in the situation and in ourselves? The challenge for so many Christians is an accepting that we are just as subject to illness and disaster in the church as anyone outside it. There's still that lingering sense we may have done something wrong, that we may deserve it. Sickness is not a sign of sin or 
wealth and health signs of blessing. We're not to be people who ask, why me? Healing, if it comes, comes not because we are better or more obedient than anyone else. It is simply because we believe and worship Jehovah Rapha. It may not be physical healing this side of the grave, but nevertheless, as Job says, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Let's pray. Jesus, with just one touch from your almighty creative hand, you have healed the sick and raised the dead. How amazing is your lordship over all the earth. How powerful is your redeeming love. How great was your sacrifice to go before us and bring forgiveness and hope. Like Moses before us, we cry out to you. By your stripes, we ask for healing. Standing within your reign and rule, we ask for restoration. May life and wellness grow in fullness until it overflows. And may we ever trust in you, our Jehovah Rapha. Amen.